So we just looked at the three general cell types, parenchyma, colenchyma, and sclerenchyma. If each of those are um, considered as like a grouping of cells, if we have all parenchyma cells, then we'd call that parenchyma tissue. If we have all colenchyma cells, we call that colenchyma tissue. And the same for sclerenchyma, we can also have sclerenchyma tissue. We can also have tissues that are made of a combination of those. So if it's just one of those cell types, we'll consider it a simple tissue. If it involves multiple cell types, then we call it a complex tissue. So let's look at some tissues. First, we'll look at meristematic tissue. So meristems, um, think about stem cells. Stem cells are these cells that have um, pluripotency, where they can, or is it totipotency? It's one of those things. I think it's pluripotency where they can divide, make new cells, and then those new cells can then specialize into any other cell type. So meristems are regions of division. Tons of mitosis would be happening in these cells. It's their whole job. A meristem divides to make more cells that can then be specialized into other cell types and tissues. So our meristematic tissues in our plants are going to be located at the tips, the growing tips of plants, because plants are gonna grow from those um, apices most often. There are times where they're not just growing from the tip, like we saw that with hornworts and that sporophyte that grew from a basal meristem that was not located at the tip. That's that term meristem where we're producing new cells. But often it's gonna be at the root tips and the shoot tips, um, but we'll also have meristematic tissue in other regions. So. Meristematic tissues, or meristems, are actively dividing regions of the plant, so they're actively undergoing mitosis, producing new cells. These are the two regions that we'll look at. When we look at roots, which we'll do first, we'll look at the root apical meristem and all of the tissues that derive from that single region, the root apical meristem, is responsible for making all of the cells within the root system. The shoot apical meristem is responsible for making all of the cells within the shoot system. So a root apical um, or a root system will have many root apical meristems. At every growing root tip, there's a root apical meristem. There is an original root apical meristem that comes from that growing embryo. The same for the shoot tips. Each shoot tip will have its own shoot apical meristem. So notice how dense these regions appear. See how um, we have this kind of locus where um, the cells get extremely small, and you can kind of see these ranks of cells that are coming out of the root apical meristem. Those are, you know, ranks of division, where those cells came from. You can sort of track their um, history of division by tracing it back to this root apical meristem. And down here, all those cells are about the same size. They're just sort of spreading out to different locations. And then as we travel up the root and down the shoot or out in the shoot, we start to see them specialize. They start to look different. Um, they're in a different location, they have a different job. So as we look at meristematic tissues, we'll try to track their pathways of where they came from, what their apical meristem was, then what their primary meristem was, and then eventually we'll have secondary meristems to look at. So we'll be tracking cells through their lineages of these meristems. So here is an example of a meristematic cell. It's just a standard parenchyma plant cell, but it can become any other type of cell. It could divide to produce vessel elements, these um, lignified cells that are open and dead and they're um, transporting water in the xylem. It could become a sclerenchyma cell, a fiber, with that thick secondary wall, um, dead at functional maturity, just providing structural support. It could become a sieve tube element or a sieve or a companion cell. Um, these two cells work together to transport uh, sugars made by photosynthesis around the plant. Or you could just become more parenchyma cells that are then going to make more parenchyma cells. And that could be filler tissue, it could be the epidermis. Um, many functions are performed by those just standard parenchyma cells. But the important part here is that a meristematic cell has the potential to become any of those cells. It's going to divide and make new cells that can then become any of those. But the meristem itself will be that one of those cells or a couple of those cells that remain in that same region continually dividing. They don't go on to specialize. Okay, so of our meristematic tissues, we'll always have this apical meristem that we'll look at, and then we'll have the primary meristems. 
So this is this developmental history of a plant. Of the primary meristems, we'll have three. And this is going to be the same in the root and the shoot. We'll have the protoderm, we'll have the ground meristem, and we'll have the procambium. These will always be our primary meristems in both the shoot and the root system how things develop from here, what tissues they're responsible for making, and what secondary meristems come out of that, will be different in the root and the shoot, and it will also be different in monocots and eudicots. So we'll have some different developmental pathways, but this will always be our starting origin. So primary tissues that could be made from the protoderm. Protoderm is really simple. It's the outermost layer of cells, and the protoderm makes the epidermis. That's the only tissue that it's going to make, and so it's pretty straightforward right there. So this is the, the sort of end of that pathway that we'll see um, in all plants and all um, root and shoot systems, is that the protoderm makes the epidermis. So proto means like prior to or previous or first, so it's the first skin, and then this makes the epidermis the outer skin, and that's our dermal tissue system. The ground meristem can make a few different things. So it's going to make ground tissues. So those could be parenchyma, collenchyma, and sclerenchyma. Um, it can also be differentiated into two different types if it, um, depending on its location. So in um, some systems, there'll be vascular tissue sort of everywhere. And so all the tissue surrounding that will be just ground tissue. But in some plant systems, you'll have these kind of neatly bounded areas where there's an inside and an outside of the vascular tissue. And that is filled with ground tissue, which we'll call the pith when it's on the inside and the cortex when it's on the outside. And I'll have this on future slides, but just um, it's a little bit more complex than it's depicted here. The procambium is going to make vascular tissue. So it'll make primary xylem and primary phloem. And that is our vascular tissue system. Let's look at the protoderm and the dermal tissue system first. The epidermis is our functioning dermal tissue system of the plant. It's the outermost cell layer of the plant, so it's just this outermost layer of cells right here. They're all parenchyma cells, and they're coated by this um, acellular part of the plant called the cuticle. The cuticle is this waxy coating made of cutin, we saw this when we looked at um, bryophytes and sort of movement of plant onto lands. land, is that that's when plants get a cuticle because they are trying to protect their insides from their outsides, right? We're trying to keep water in, not lose water, um, as well as protect ourselves from a little bit of herbivory. So this is made of a waxy compound called cutin, and um, its main function is protection, mostly from water loss. So it's a waxy layer just on the outside of the epidermis. Here we have our cuticle made of cutin, waxy, um, and then we have this layer of small cells under that called the epidermis, and what cell type is the epidermis? This evenly thin primary wall would be parenchyma cells. And all of the cells that we'll see in the epidermis are parenchyma cells, which is kind of nice. The epidermis is a simple tissue system. Here are some examples of cells that you would see in the epidermis. So you would see guard cells, these parentheses shaped cells. So each one of those, there's two of them, surrounds, flanks this hole in the epidermis. So this is called a stoma. It's a hole straight through the epidermis that allows for gas exchange. In um, liverworts and hornworts and um, some of the mosses, we saw just simple pores, holes, directly through that epidermis that allowed for gas exchange, but they weren't regulated. There was no way to open and close them. So that really limited where bryophytes, and still limits, where bryophytes can grow because they don't have very good regulation on water loss. Because one of the gases that ends up leaving through the stomata, stomata is plural for stoma, is water vapor. So plants are 90% water. The exterior envir environment, if it's not 90% water, right, 90% humidity, then water is going to be pulled out of that plant tissue because water is going to move from areas of high concentration to low concentration. So anytime a stoma is open, it has the potential to be losing water. And that 
functionally helps pull water from the roots because there's this whole like vacuum system of water moving from the roots up into the shoots. Um, and that's controlled by these guard cells that can open and close the stoma depending on the needs of the plant. So these are two parenchyma cells that have an extremely important function in plants, highly involved in photosynthesis and water transportation. The stoma is not a cell, it's just a hole, but the whole stomata kind of system is made up of two guard cells and a stoma. Other cells you might see in the epidermis are hairs. So hairs on a plant are called trichomes. Here we have some glandular trichomes that are exuding some sticky fluid that's going to help this sundew capture insects. Um, these hairs can be unicellular or they can be multicellular. Often there you'll be able to see um, the nuclei within those cells so they can be alive, um, actively performing functions for the plant. They could be dead. Um, it all depends on the sort of function they're serving. Trichomes are incredibly diverse and that diversity stems from the diversity of functions that they end up performing. Here we can see a buckwheat growing in the dunes and it's covered by these trichomes that make it look the silvery pale color. So the actual leaves are a dark green. There's a bee that cards off those trichomes. It's called the wool carder bee, I think, or leaf carder bee. I can't remember. Um, but it shaves off those trichomes and uses them to make its nest. And so often you'll see these buckwheats with these really dark brown patches, or dark green patches from those bees scraping off those trichomes. But that's what color they are underneath, dark green, because that green is from the chlorophyll that they need for photosynthesis. But dark means that you're absorbing more sunlight. And if you're out in the dunes where you're really water limited and you have this sandy soil where water just pours right through it, you need to have a way to keep your water in. So you can have a thick cuticle, but another way you can do it is cover yourself in these silvery trichomes that are then reflecting more of the sunlight, as well as forming this barrier of cells where when water vapor tries to escape, it might have a chance to condense or get stuck in those trichomes, and it will also change the sort of humidity layer just right above the leaf surface. It's like having a little tiny forest, right? You could have a desert where it's totally open, and that will have um, kind of the same humidity content as the all of the air around it. Or you can have a little forest that maintains a higher humidity and has less chance of water escaping from those cells. So, Trichomes can function to help prevent water loss, they can prevent sun damage, and they can help prevent herbivory. Because if you think about a leaf, it's like a juicy steak. But would you want to eat a juicy steak covered in hair? I don't know. Okay, I'm going to pause here because we're about to move into another tissue system.